It was collection mania. For centuries, Europeans lusted after what they saw as exotic treasures from all over the world. In colonial times, German museums filled exhibition halls and storage facilities with millions of objects. Today, troves of such artifacts molder in German museum basements, while the lands they came from are left empty-handed. A lot of that material was traded, stolen and leached out. Returning such objects to their cultures of origin is the exception rather than the rule. There's a lot of stonewalling. The primary fear is of arousing covetousness. You don't want to give things back, so you keep quiet about them. And yet artifacts stored by German museums are seldom well preserved. A state of emergency has long been the norm. Insects and even apparently rats get in. It's partly infested. The situation's critical. Everything's getting moldy. So what does it actually look like inside German museum collections? And what do the bleak conditions mean for cultural heritage in a post-colonial world? It's October 2019, and I'm about to arrive on the island of Tongatapu in the southern Pacific. This is Nukualofa, the capital of the Kingdom of Tonga, 16,500 kilometers from Germany. But this is no South Sea vacation. Rather, I'm on an unusual mission. There's a festive mood in Tonga's capital. Princess Frederica, the niece of the king, has taken her place of honor. Tongan flags fly above the Ancient Tonga exhibition. Among the guests are culture lovers and diplomats. Even Tonga's prime minister is here. Like many things in Tonga, the proceedings follow a strict protocol. First to speak are the guests from Germany. We're presenting Tonga with replicas of 250-year-old artifacts taken from the South Pacific. Next, the head of the host institution expresses her gratitude for this opportunity to reconnect with her country's cultural roots. And then it's my turn to speak. As the exhibition's organizer, I brought with me the catalogue detailing Tongan treasures that have been held in Germany for centuries. Finally, Princess Frederica opens the Cook Forster Pavilion. It's named after British explorer James Cook and two German naturalists, the Forsters, who were the first Europeans to explore Tonga alongside Captain Cook. When they left, they took many, many Tongan treasures with them. 250 years later, some of these cultural artifacts are finally coming home. To many Tongans, it feels like a miracle that these objects were able to survive so far from home for so long. And in fact, the truth is that they were nearly destroyed by mold. The story of the object's long journey begins with legendary British explorer, Captain James Cook. In 1773, on his second circumnavigation of the world, he first visited the Tongan archipelago in the Pacific. The Forsters collected hundreds of cultural objects on this trip through the Pacific Islands, the largest such collection to come out of all Cook's voyages. The so-called South Sea Curiosities became part of collections in Oxford, Vienna, Göttingen and Wurlitz. What's fascinating about the Forster collection is that the pieces are so old. They were collected at a time when Pacific Islanders first came face to face with Europeans on their coasts. Shockingly, items from such an historic voyage are not always well preserved, a fact that became clear to me while researching in Gorta in 2008. 
For more than two centuries, Georg Forster's most beautiful illustrations have been kept here in the research library. They were arranged to be brought here by none other than the legendary German writer Goethe. Library staff laid them out with pride. But when I looked closer, I was taken aback. Forster's Pacific illustrations were shriveling up, the paint was flaking, and there were even cracks. It took a television report on the situation to prompt some urgently needed restoration. For almost two years, restorers in Munich used expensive, high-tech methods to save Forster's illustrations. If the illustrations made by Germany's first great voyager were so endangered, I wondered in what condition were the ethnological objects the Forsters brought back from the Pacific. My research took me to Wurlitz Castle in Saxony-Anhalt, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was here that 250 years ago, Prince Franz of Anhalt-Dessau and his wife, Princess Luisa, assembled one of the first German collections of objects from the South Seas. They built a small museum for their collection, the Forster Pavilion. Open to the public, it was intended to provide their subjects with a glimpse of foreign worlds. When I arrived in summer 2016, I was shocked by the state of the Forster Pavilion. Thankfully, despite their discomfort, those in charge in Wurlitz allowed me to film there. We don't really want to show this. It casts us in a bad light. People usually say, you've got money, why don't you just fix it up? In fact, the Forster Pavilion in Wurlitz closed 30 years ago, when East Germany ceased to exist. But even before that, objects from Tonga, Tahiti and New Zealand had been disappearing into storage for decades. Six months after my visit, the Wurlitz Cultural Foundation asked if I wanted to help bring the Forster collection out of storage and back into the light of an exhibition. I agreed. Now, as a curator, I began to open doors that would otherwise have remained closed to me, and I began to see the full extent of the problems in Wurlitz. My first visit to the storage facility was a shock. At first, the objects seemed to be in good condition, considering they were 250 years old. But some of these turned out to be duplicates. The originals were so damaged that plastic copies had been made as a precaution. This fishing net from Tonga was so tangled that it could never be spread out again. How could this happen? It's 1984. With great enthusiasm, the Georg Forster collection opens in Wurlitz. At some point it becomes clear that it gets cold in the pavilion in winter, so electric heating is installed to keep temperatures above zero. But a few months later, we realize everything's getting moldy. In the summer of 2018, preservationists inspected the Forster collection in preparation for putting it back on display. Many of the pieces were fragile and brittle. Despite being considered well-preserved, a quarter of the Forster collection had been lost. In Wurlitz, people were open about what had happened, but that's unusual in Germany. Few ethnological museums allow the kind of access I was given as a curator. Why is that? After all, these are public institutions. Nobody wants to be exposed as not being in control of the situation. If there's talk of water damage and mold, and things being lost, the facade cracks. Benedict Savoy is a historian with professorships in Paris and Berlin. An outspoken critic of Berlin's new Humboldt Forum Museum, she says institutions like this one duck transparency and not out of a fear of embarrassment. In fact, she's discovered that the practice of public accounting in German museum repositories stopped in the mid-1980s. 
die Museumsdirektoren unter sich an der Museum Directors under the leadership of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and its then president made the decision. Wir werden They weren't going to publish lists of objects. They said it would arouse desire for the objects, covetousness. Das heißt, so they stonewalled and stopped publishing any lists or catalogues whatsoever. Were these museums castigated for their self-imposed policy of silence? Quite the opposite, it would seem. Just look at the German government's prestige project, the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. It's said to be the showcase of the city's ethnological museum. But the foreign treasures that will go on display at the Humboldt Forum are just a fraction of the museum's holdings. About 10,000 objects will be shown, not even 2% of the collection. The other 98%, more than half a million pieces, remain in darkness, in a storage depot in the suburb of Dahlem they will probably never see the light of an exhibition. The Dahlem Depot is from the 60s, and it looks like any other building from the 60s. Big windows, a flat roof, and so on. Rain gets in when there's heavy rainfall. The walls aren't quite sealed. The wind gets in. Insects and even, apparently, rats get in. Ethnologist Andreas Schlotauer is one of the world's foremost experts on feather jewelry. He witnessed conditions inside the storage facility firsthand when he spent two years there photographing the collection's 2,000 feather objects, piece by piece. What he discovered was a truly alarming amount of insect damage. When I asked, I found out that the cabinets aren't sealed. Hardly any of them have proper linings. That means that insects in the rooms can get into the cabinets too. Lots of pieces are in this sort of condition. They've never been properly restored or cared for in over 100 years. They've just been in storage. And look at this. Here's a piece in storage in Dahlem, and from the same collection from the same period, the piece in St. Gallen in Switzerland looks like this. In the summer of 2020, the situation in Berlin became public. The German Council of Science and the Humanities recommended dissolving the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Newspapers ran headlines like, The Roof is Caving, Farewell Prussia, or simply, Bombshell. The council criticized the Berlin Ethnological Museum in particular. Suddenly, serious problems that had been swept under the rug for decades were being discussed out in the open. It's clear something has to happen with the Ethnological Museum. We have to improve accessibility and storage conditions. The depot needs a far better renovation. It's partly infested. The situation's critical. The collection isn't existentially threatened, but something definitely needs to be done. A serious lack of oversight has created a problem that affects almost all of Germany's big ethnological museums. Munich's Museum Fünf Continent, or Five Continents Museum, is showing an exhibition called Tiki Mania, featuring artifacts from the Marquesas Islands collected by ethnologist Karl von den Steinen in the 19th and early 20th century. Clarifying provenance is a big undertaking for any ethnological museum. Sometimes the process takes years. But in Munich, it's not even clear how many of the museum's original 160,000 pieces it still owns, and how many were lost in the war, exchanged, or sold in the 1960s. So far, only 57,000 objects have been accounted for, or about a third of the museum's original holdings. We're still taking inventory. Right now, it's going quite slowly, 10,000 objects per year. At that pace, we'd need another 10 years. We need financial resources to bring on extra staff and create new positions. That's not happening at most ethnological institutions. Staff numbers have been stagnating for years, while the demands have grown enormously. 
A comprehensive inventory is urgently needed. This is also true for the Museum am Rotenbaum, formerly the Hamburg Ethnological Museum. It's one of the few institutions that allows people into its storage facility. Look at what's written on this label. It's an Asante arrow quiver from Ghana. It's not about assessing the aesthetics of the object, but simply working out what it is. Two students are forerunners in an experiment. Eventually, they hope to be part of a team of 20 young people whose job it will be to digitize the Hamburg Museum's 275,000 objects. Their tasks will also include locating objects that have slipped through the cracks and are currently unaccounted for. I've been in Hamburg for three years. Before my time, parts of the storage depot had to be cleared out because there were things like roof damage and then a big asbestos problem in the building. Things were packed up quickly and there was no record made of what was where or in which box. We're still dealing with that. We have to do a lot of searching. So what would it take for a museum like this one to completely document its own holdings? The answer can be found here at the Musée du Quai Branly in Paris. It's a role model for European ethnological museums. Digitizing its 275,000 objects meant creating 32 extra permanent staff positions and hiring 41 freelance specialists. They worked for five years at a total cost of 31 million euros. It was a top priority for French presidents. The result is a digital museum collection whose objects can also be viewed from their places of origin, like Haiti or Senegal. That's light years ahead of Germany. At the beginning of the 80s, countries like Switzerland, France and Great Britain started to use computers to make systematic inventories. But German, that is to say West German museums, weren't interested. So the problem now is that they have to catch up on 40 years of development, 40 years of electronic inventory recording. You can't do that in five minutes. France has announced plans for the restitution of cultural objects. But the colonial histories of these collections continue to weigh heavily. One response is to invite artists into museums to raise awareness. This is a video installation by Maori artist Lisa Rehana from New Zealand. She's animated European stereotypes of South Sea Islanders using images taken from a piece of 19th century French wallpaper. Part of her goal is to problematize a European gaze that lumps together any number of distinct cultures under the umbrella of the exotic. But the work also confronts the unsung cruelty of Captain Cook's voyages of discovery. Her question about just how violent the voyages in the Pacific were made me think about my exhibition in Wurlitz. How did the Forsters really come to possess the objects they brought back from their expedition with Captain Cook? I met Lisa Rehana in Paris and talked about the collection mania that was a part of Cook's voyages. She agreed to add her perspective as a Maori artist to the new Forster exhibition in Wurlitz. Her artworks tell the story of European exploration from the perspective of those being explored. From the Maori perspective, it's a story of pain exploitation and loss. I first came across Cook when I was thinking about our Māori whakaira or carving work and realised that I needed to come overseas to lots of other museums in order to see some of the, um, the artworks that are from my area because my father, he's Ngāpuhi, so he's of a tribe of the far north. And this was one of the first places where a lot of that material was traded, stolen and leached out. Were the Forsters involved in the cultural dispossession of the Maori on Cook's Pacific expeditions? Exactly how had they come into possession of their South Sea objects? In Wurlitz, I came across unsettling notes in the Forsters' travel journal. The younger Georg Forsters seemed to have felt a sense of equality with the Pacific people, 
but his father resorted to armed force to get his way. Artists from New Zealand and Tonga and experts from the University of Auckland came to take a closer look at the Forster collection. For the first time in 250 years, people from Oceania were holding these artifacts of their culture in their own hands. They also brought with them a specific cultural knowledge. In a manner of speaking, they were able to read the objects. What they found was that the design of many pieces from Tonga, the patterns on woven bags, ceremonial clubs and fabrics, suggested royal gifts. These would have been objects the Forsters could not have traded or bartered for. And from a Tongan perspective, they also couldn't be returned. That's because they represent Tanaloa, the consolidation of a relationship. So we came up with the idea to give replicas to Tonga, a kind of thank you gift. So it's really good to be able to touch and feel it for the people to, you know, to hand for it and all that. And actually to see closer to techniques and things like this. And able to hold it because it's almost the same, exactly the same as the original. A bright spot in the otherwise shadowy world of Germany's museum storage depots. Still, a handful of pilot projects give cause for optimism. One is at the Museum am Rotenbaum. There, the Benin Digital project is working to create a virtual museum. The collection's focus is on the controversial Benin bronzes, stolen from present-day Nigeria. The Hamburg Museum owns dozens of these pieces, which were looted by the British in 1897, part of a so-called punitive expedition. Evidence of the brutal burning of Benin City can be seen in this bronze snake's head. It melted right off the roof of the royal palace. A museum is going to be founded in Benin City, the Royal Museum, and this digital project accompanies that process. Could you imagine eventually giving things from Hamburg back to Benin City? Yes, of course. That's a goal we're working towards. Of course, these objects should be returned in one form or another. The topic of restitution is also gaining momentum in Berlin, albeit slowly. But contact with the cultures that created these objects has also been pursued here in recent years, specifically by the new Humboldt Forum. Representatives of the Omaha tribe of Nebraska, for example, have been invited to Berlin ahead of an exhibition. They're sharing their knowledge of these objects created by their forefathers, as well as their thoughts on the exhibit. Some sort of uh, fireplace, mm -hmm. perhaps that's it. Uh, perhaps even the, um, the smell of burning wood. In the Dalam storage facility, the Omaha objects are being prepared for the exhibition. The objects were collected for the Berlin Ethnological Museum by Omaha ethnologist Francis Lafleche almost 120 years ago. Before they can be displayed at the Humboldt Forum, they have to be cleared of any possible pests and properly conserved. Omaha tribe members first saw the Lafleche collection in 2018. That encounter resulted in some of the so-called covetousness so dreaded by ethnological museums. One of the very first things was, well, we want those materials back. And so Mike said, hold on. So he went into his office and he brought out the bill of sale. And he said, your ancestor sold these to the German museum. And after that, it was zip. <laughs> so so it, it was good though to clear that up. It's one thing to produce paperwork showing that a museum's ownership is legally viable, but moral justification is another question altogether. How can the museum's interests be weighed against those of people whose own culture produced these objects? 
The Omaha didn't even know this collection was here. It came from their community and now they can appraise it here and even quite confidently lay claim to certain parts of the collection. But it's also clear they want to be represented in museums because that's important for their identity. These sorts of negotiations will be important in the future. That's what the future holds for museums. Whether in Berlin, Hamburg or Munich, this future will depend on how quickly museums can become more transparent and how they manage the shift towards digital and virtual exhibitions. They have to want to do it, and I think that's slowly happening. What's needed now is the investment in technology and in people. That means in the future, ethnological museums will need a lot more money and a lot more staff, a kind of fast-track program. That is, if they really do want to share these endangered treasures with the people whose ancestors made them. <laughs>